So welcome, everyone. Thank you for coming out to our tutorial on driving the need for identity authentication and encryption. The motivation behind this workshop is to help you folks understand how identity plays a critical role in how we run workloads, especially when it comes to environments like Kubernetes. In Kubernetes, uh, we actually have very interesting ways in which workloads can come online, get on the network, and then also have identity attached to them so we can verify where services are going, who they're talking to, and what they're up to. And hello, Tim and Kat, welcome to the conversation. Um, so having said that, my name is Marina Widje. I am a solutions engineer at a company called Commodore that focuses in on Kubernetes reliability and my name is Peter Yashovitz. I'm a platform advocate at Solo.io. Excellent. So on our agenda, we're going to cover some basics around certificates, identity, authentication, authorization, and then we'll get into technologies like Spiffy and Spire and how the, the Spiffy verifiable ID or identification document helps with you know, attesting workloads. And then we'll dig into a hands-on lab very quickly. Uh, which will give us you know, an insight as to how we stand up TLS or MTLS and then leverage things like certificates and assign certificates to workloads in Kubernetes. And we'll use tools like the Istio CSR to accomplish this alongside Cert Manager, as well as the Istio Service Mesh to, to, lay the, to provide the layer or foundation for our workloads. So let's dig in right into this. Um, there are three components that are generally involved when it comes to the delivery of certificates to workloads. We've got IstioD, which is actually our control plane in Kubernetes. So how many of you actually use Kubernetes today? Yay, everyone, okay, or most people here. Now, once you've gotten past the I'm running workloads in Kubernetes, you start to realize that identity and even encryption become critical to some of your security needs. Uh, so we, we talk about Istio specifically, but there are other service meshes that exist that provide similar functionality. We're focusing on Istio. And so Istio D as a control plane is the one that hands out certificates by default to workloads. So I have a pod, I have several pods, and I'll hand them out as necessary. We also have something called the Istio agent, and if you all are familiar with this, something called the Envoy proxy. How many of you know what the Envoy proxy is? Yeah, well, obviously Cat would know. <laughs> yes, so the Envoy proxy is a high-powered layer four, layer seven, I'd like to call router, that allows you to customize how traffic flows through that router and what it does on behalf of other workloads. Traditionally, um, it has been used standalone, but we realize that it can get very complex when you start to operate at scale, and you can build some customization around that and wrap automation around it. Istio solves that problem for us because it's written a bunch of what we call filters for Envoy, so you don't have to sit there and manage that for yourself anymore. Uh, you do all of your configuration through something called Istio, and then that passes and gets translated into Envoy configurations. Now, why, why does this even matter? Because when it comes to using Istio, we have this concept called sidecars. Sidecars in Kubernetes means that there's going to be a secondary container that acts as some sort of service to assist your application or your workload. That service could be a proxy, which actually proxies connections and might do things like rate limiting, it might even authenticate services for you so that you can either allow or disallow other services to communicate with it. That's what the Envoy proxy is doing, but you just can't sit there and program each one manually. This is very much like how we wouldn't sit there and manually configure routers in our physical environment anymore. We would use some level of API and automation and network automation to achieve that. Same concept here. Now, in IstioD, there's a concept or there's a, there's a process called Citadel, and that acts as the certificate authority, which actually signs and issues all the certificates to your workloads, meaning it's the original truster and says, you know, if I'm giving you a certificate, it's trusted by me, so everyone else should inherently trust it as well. Now, there's that second component called the Istio agent, and it's a, it's a process that runs in the sidecar proxy, and it's actually responsible for communicating with Citadel to request that certificate for the workload. And then it just makes the cert and the key available to Envoy proxy, or the Envoy proxy, through something called the Secret Discovery Service, or SDS for short. The SEO agent is also going to be responsible for helping with the rotation of those certificates because we want them to, the, to expire. For example, if you have a credential, we don't want it long-lived. We want it to live for a very short period of time, and then we want to create a new credential. 
right? And that actually mitigates any malicious attacks. If someone has a hold of your certificate that's long lived, what can they do? That's effectively what we're trying to prevent here. Now Envoy, as I mentioned, is the sidecar proxy that is receiving all these certificates and is going to authenticate and additionally authorize other services for communication. Now, in the, with the concept of identity, there's a few key components to consider. Um, there's SPIFI, which is the, uh, damn, I forgot the name of, or what does it stand for again? Let me turn my mic on. <laughs> This gives I me time to think a, it's about. It's such an acronym that I can't remember. <laughs> it's Secure Production Identity Framework for Everyone. Uh, but Spiffy is much easier to remember. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, for workloads that are inside of the mesh and for them to be able to use something called mutual TLS, where bi-directionally they have to authenticate each other and verify their identity appropriately, that is a mechanism that allows for some form of access control. Uh, but the thing is, what we're doing is we're authenticating services, but we also have to you know, validate who they say they are. We have to attest them somehow. A service can have a certificate, but if that certificate was issued through some malicious process or, or through some unconventional means, we haven't attested the workload, so we can't truly verify if it's legitimate and if it should be talking to other workloads or other services. So within Istio, this identity comes in the form of a SPIF VID document um, that actually gets encoded in an X509 certificate uh, that is signed by some sort of trusted authority. Um, the SPIFI ID is actually a string, and if you look at it, it's this little format here where it actually specifies the domain name, the, um, the namespace itself that it exists in, the service account, as well as the actual end service that is going to have the SPIFI ID attached to it. Uh, so we can effectively just encode this ID inside of a, an X509 certificate and issue that directly to the workload itself. And this DOD will help facilitate a lot of this for us. Now there are other options that are available to us as well, external CAs, because here's the thing, we would start off maybe using a self-signed cert from ISTOD initially, but longer term we'd probably want to use something of an external CA that we still own that we can control that also maybe integrates with other areas of our environments and networks too. So ISTOD uses, for example, um, some base CA data to push, push it directly to something called config maps in Kubernetes. So inside of a workload, um, you can stand it up, but if you want to give it some additional configuration data, we use something called a config map and specify that data here. This is exactly what ISTOD is doing. That base, um, sorry, that base CA data is either going to come in the form of a CA secret or a CA cert secret, uh, so that when ISTOD actually starts it up, it actually looks for something called a CA cert secret and pushes that information um, to config maps. So it gets stored inside of the config map itself. Um, as for some of the external CAs that exist, we can use something called cert manager and Cert Manager helps with the issuance of certificates and ties that to something called the, the Kubernetes Certificate Signing Request Resource. Um, effectively, what that means is now we don't have to depend on SDOD to do this. We actually leverage Cert Manager to achieve this. So is there anything else you wanted to add to that? No, I think, I think we'll go, I think one of the next slides, uh, we have, yeah, there, we have an elaborate. Uh, uh, of how like, is, uh, like Cert Manager, Istio yeah, and basically a flow of things, how everything happens when, when you have Istio CSR in place and when you're using something like Cert Manager, right? But the idea here with this uh, diagram or flow diagram, whatever you want to call it, is that it just shows how everything can be um, replaced if you wanted to, right? So it's all pluggable. Uh, as Marino mentioned, by default, Istio D, it starts, is going to look for that specific secret uh, it's TOCA, I think uh, it's called, right? Uh, and it's going to use that as a CA to sign all the workload certificates, right? But what you can do is you could say, well, let me set up uh, Cert Manager, let me set up STO CSR, and let Cert Manager actually create the uh, CA or the intermediate certificate out of that CA, and then STO, instead of creating its own, is going to use the one that you've provided. And then if you, at any point, you want to rotate those, uh, Cert Manager can do it for you, right? So you don't have to restart STO, you don't have to delete and recreate those, uh, those things manually. Perfect. So once we've actually had that all set up, once we have our certificates issued to our workloads, 
we have a lot more control as to how we can allow and disallow workloads to communicate with each other. We have something called authentication, which actually allows us to decide if, let's say we have two workloads. One might have a sidecar with certificates, one might not have a sidecar with, without the certificate present. And the situation might be where you're doing like a migration or you're migrating workloads into Kubernetes and you still need to, or sorry, you're migrating workloads into a service mesh and you still need to maintain some level of connectivity because there's this, uh, this particular um, custom resource called the peer authentication resource, which actually looks to see if we're using plain text authentication, meaning we're not really authenticating the other end, we're just making sure that we can connect to them, we'll have our maybe certificate, but that whole, um, that whole nature of having to encrypt the, the communications is not required. Now in the situation where we have a strict configuration, this means that both ends require a certificate. Uh, that means both ends must be running TLS or MTLS must be present. And without that, communication won't happen. So it's kind of like a miniature firewall in some sort of way. But it's not, it's not really a firewall. It's really just looking to see if, if we can negotiate to encrypt that, that data in motion. If we cannot, well, the connection won't happen. And we can even disable peer authentication together so that there, aren't a there isn't a requirement to have certificates or MTLS present at all. Now, once you've gotten beyond the whole, I have authenticated you and we can start that flow of communication, there's an element of authorization. So the best example is once you've gotten through the front door, what can you do? What are you allowed to do? Can you go to all the rooms? Can you go inside all, all of the rooms? Can you pick up objects? Can you walk away with objects? Can you throw objects in the trash? Can you add objects into the room? That's effectively what authorization is doing for you. So once you've authenticated, you're now deciding through policy what services can, what action services can take across other services. Meaning at the HTTP level, what kind of requests can I make? Can I make put requests, get requests, delete requests? And we'll see some of that when we get into the lab. All right. I think we can flip over to Spire and get a little bit deeper. So this is you. Let's go, Peter. Awesome. You barreled through this in 15 minutes. <laughs> uh, all right, so I'll, I'll start with Spire. Um, we mentioned Spiffy, right? Um, but I'll, I'll start with Spire and then we'll dig into and explain Spiffy as well in details, right? So what is Spire, the definition? Uh, let me just make this a bigger here. A little bit bigger. So Spire is a production ready implementation of Spiffy APIs that perform node and workload at this station. So that's something that Marina already mentioned to secure, securely issue SVIDs. SVIDs uh, secure a verifiable identity document. Think X509 or JOT. Uh, so securely issue SVIDs, certs uh, to workloads and then verify SVIDs of other workloads based on some conditions, right? Uh, it's I like to start with definitions always and then go and break down specific things. So I'll go and break down the things that I uh, bolded on the slide. So SPIFI stands for Secure Production Identity Framework for Everyone. It basically defines a uh, spec and a set of standards for identifying and um, securing communication between workloads. So when I'm talking about like workloads here, it's not necessarily workloads on a level of a node, right? It's more of a workloads at a more granular level, right? If you think about Kubernetes clusters, uh, workload here is an actual pod or an instance of the pod that's running in, uh, inside of the cluster. So it's more, it's more fine-grained, right, than just a node. So at a high level, um, I know when I first started looking into Spiffy and Spire, it was like a lot of new things, a lot of new words and everything, but uh, it's actually fairly straightforward. So Spiffy does three things, defines three things. First one is uh, how the services are identified. And Marino mentioned Spiffy ID. So that's that unique string that uh, in Istio's case, when, we're, when we are in Kubernetes, when we're at, using Istio, in Istio, Istio's case, the, the Spiffy ID has that specific format, which is comprised of Spiffy colon slash slash trust domain, namespace identifier and the namespace name, and then service account SA slash service account name. However, that's not, uh, that's not set in stone, right? So Spiffy 
think, thinking about Spiffy Inspire outside of Kubernetes, outside of Istio, you can define these IDs to be whatever you want them to be, right? If you want to add like a workload ID, if you want to add your organization name, a team name, a person's name who's responsible for it, it doesn't really matter, right? The idea here is that these IDs are configurable and you can make them as fine-grained as you like. But the nice thing about it is that if you implement this yourself, if you create an implementation of the Spiffy spec, then you can use those different portions from the Spiffy ID to authorize workloads, to use in part of the, uh, as part of the authorization policies, right? So that's the first thing. The second thing that Spiffy uh, defines is how are these, how and slash where are these Spiffy IDs encoded in SVIDs. So SVIDs, Spiffy Verifiable Identity Document, a certificate pretty much. Uh, so second thing that it defines, how and where are these IDs encoded in? And for that, the reason you need to know that is so you can extract it out when you're doing mutual TLS and then use it for authorization later, right? Uh, in a case of Istio, these get encoded into uh, subject alternate name fields in the certificates. And we'll see that in the lab later on uh, when we're inspecting the, um, the certificates. And then lastly, uh, it also defines and specifies how are these SVIDs, how are these certificates issued to uh, the workloads? And it has an API called the workload API. So it does those three things. So that was Spiffy. So let's look at what Spire is and how Spire uh, looks like. So Spire is an implementation of the Spiffy spec, right? So it's just an implementation of that uh, specification. That's one project that implements Spiffy. The second project that implements Spiffy spec is Istio, right? So Istio has the implementation of the spec. However, you can use mix and match these if you want to. So by default, when you install Istio, you're gonna be using Spiffy IDs and the implementation of the spec is gonna be done by Istio D, is gonna be done by Istio agent and all the components that make up the mesh. But you can also say, well, I don't wanna use that implementation because maybe we already have a Spire server running, maybe we have some identity solution somewhere already. You can do that as well. And you can tell Istio, hey, I don't want your implementation, I want you to use that Spire implementation instead and just pass everything through that. Right? And we'll see this uh, uh, in the labs again. Mm, all right, so at a high level, we have Spire server and we have one or more agents. So agents are running on, uh, on nodes, uh, one on each node. Both components do uh, expose an API. So the Spire server, when it starts up, what it does is it takes account of all the workloads that are running on your cluster and registers them. So it creates entries for those workloads. The second thing, when the Spire agents come up, um, the workloads are configured to talk with the Spire agent through the workload API. And the workloads are gonna go through that API and say, hey, uh, give me an identity. I'm a pod called hello world. I have these labels. Uh, this is my process ID. This is my this, this is my group ID, et cetera, et cetera. Give me an identity. The Spire agent will then talk to the Spire server and say, hey, we have this thing here with these labels uh, and they're asking for identity. Do you have something in your registration entries that matches those labels and selectors? And if you do, give it to me, right? So the Spire agent, uh, the Spire server will look through the registration entries. They'll say, oh, that we have a hello world here with these labels. You're good to go, and the Spire agent will actually issue uh, issue a certificate to uh, to the workload. The Spire server acts as a signing authority, and then it issues those certificates through through the Spire agents. Uh, it's configurable, right? So you can configure the uh, trust domain. You can configure. Um, uh, instead of using like a self-signed, right, CA, which you shouldn't be using anyway, right, uh, you can configure it to use uh, a cert manager or something outside. Uh, I know AWS and Google both have their uh, certificate management solutions, if that's what they're called, right? Uh, uh, so it's fairly extensible. There's different portions uh, that you can configure using uh, plugins. 
All right, so uh, let's talk about briefly about node attestation, which is very similar to what uh, and how the workload attestation looks like. Um, so attestation is basically a process of establishing an identity of either the node or the workload itself. So with, uh, with the node attestation, so what happens is that both Spire server and the agents are gonna work together to verify the identity of the node that the workload is running on. And the way that they do that is through uh, node attesters. So there's a, um, there's a uh, AWS node attester, for example, there are GCP, there's Azure ones as well, right? And that node attester plugin that your Spire server is configured with knows how to talk to AWS to get the proof of the node's identity. So the Spire uh, agent will make a call uh, to AWS and it's gonna get back the proof of the node's identity. The agent is then gonna send the gathered proof of the identity to the server. And server has an AWS node attester plugin as well. And then the server is gonna independently validate and verify the uh, identity of the node as well. So once the identity is validated, a spiffy ID is gonna be created for the agent and it's gonna be uh, sent back to the agent. And then the agent is gonna use that SVID to talk to the server through mutual TLS. So that was that was known at the station, but workload at the station works the same way, right? It's there's plugins that know how to there's a Kubernetes plugin, there's a Docker plugin that can gather different information about the workload, and then both Spire server and agent work together to uh, uh, validate and verify that identity. So if you look at the Spire in the context of Istio, so when you're running workloads on Kubernetes and you have Istio service mesh, uh, most of them, all of them are gonna be deployed at Kubernetes pods. And then within the pod, you're gonna have two containers. You're gonna have your application and you're gonna have your uh, sidecar, sidecar that runs the Envoy a proxy. Now, if we go even a little bit deeper into that sidecar portion, there's two, two binaries in there. One is the Envoy proxy binary. The second one is the Istio agent. And the Istio agent is the one that it's actually bootstrapping the Envoy proxy, launching it, and then also provisioning identities uh, for the workloads. So this is similar to that uh, diagram on slide two or three. Um, so Istio agent uses secret discovery service, SDS, to talk uh, to the Envoy. Actually, Envoy uses SDS to talk to uh, the Istio agent. Istio agent is the one that implements that interface. Um, agent, when it starts, is gonna create the private key and the certificate signing request, and it's gonna send that to uh, Istio's control plane. Istio D will validate the credentials and is gonna send back the signed certificate to the Istio agent. So the Istio agent implements this SDS interface and then it's gonna, it streams the, uh, 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 the certificate and key, it streams it to the Envoy proxy. And then as the requests are coming into your pod, they will always go through the Envoy proxy. Envoy proxy will present uh, that certificate. It'll do mutual TLS. Uh, 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 with the other side, and then it's gonna pass the, um, pass the packets to your application. So by default, uh, Istio agent, when it launches, it's gonna start up this SDS server, this implementation of the interface. However, there is a logic in there uh, that checks whether, that checks for a specific socket and a specific path, and if the socket doesn't exist, the SDS server will start but if it already exists, it's not gonna start it, it's just gonna say, well, use this, it's already there, uh, uh, we're not gonna handle it, right? That's something, right, that's on that socket uh, is, is and or can be the Spire agent, right? So this diagram looks very similar to the previous one. The only difference here is that Istio agent is not acting as the SDS implementer anymore right? That's what the Spire agent is doing in this case, right? So in this case, Envoy, the Spire agent will mount the socket into that pod and Envoy will talk through that socket to the Spire agent whenever it needs certificates. As he is, uh, the Spire agent will stream the certificates 
uh, back to the Envoy proxy. And in the previous case, it was STOD who was doing that, right? Uh, just a quick look at the setup in Kubernetes, uh, how that's gonna look like. So we'll, we'll, we'll install uh, multiple Spire agents. I think we have three nodes or maybe even one. I don't think it matters in the end. It's, there's, it's, the, the agents run as daemon sets, right? There's one per, per node and there's one central Spire server um, that has the controller. I think it's called registration manager right now. Uh, that does the registration of all the workloads when it starts. Um, one thing to note here, I don't think we have a slide on that, is uh, um, Spire agent can also run outside of the cluster, right? It doesn't have to run inside the cluster. You can run it in a separate VM. You can run it pretty much anywhere you like. You can nest Spire servers if you want to. Uh, so it's very flexible in terms of uh, how you want to set up and architect the whole uh, solution. All right, uh, I think we're right on time to jump into the hands-on labs. I, I see everyone with their laptops out already, but uh, <laughs> uh, you can, uh, if you scan the, scan the QR code, you'll get to the, uh, to the Instruct workshop. And I'm just trying to turn off uh, mirroring and so I don't have to look that way. Where do you turn off the mirroring? Oh. Where it displays, um, and then click arrange. Oh, no, no, sorry. Uh, should be further up at the top. Oh, there it is. Uh, mirror, right? Yep. All right, perfect. Uh, let me just go. Where is it? I thought I had it open. Oh, there it is. Yeah, so if you scan that, if, if you had scanned that code, you would end up on a page like this. Uh, and I'll just click start and we'll go through the labs as soon as this starts up. Uh, it'll be two minutes, so, so you can sing if you want or tell a joke or if there's any questions, uh, uh, we can take those as well while we're waiting here. Or you can just listen to me try to fill out the... <laughs> the silence here, but... <laughs> it's, it's really nice how Instruct actually has those little captions at the very bottom there. Uh, why don't we explain what we're going to be doing in, this, in, the, in the three modules here? So the first module, we're going to be installing um, Cert Manager and Istio as well, yes. right? Yeah, so in the, first, the first one that we'll go through will be basically the practical portion of that complicated diagram that Marino showed. Uh, so we'll install and configure Cert Manager, we'll install and configure Istio CSR, uh, and then we'll install Istio and we'll have Istio use uh, a CA issued by the certificate uh, uh, by the Cert Manager in order to use that Cert Manager, uh, that CA to sign the workload uh, certificates. So that will be the first one. And then the second one is going to be the authorization, uh, authorization and policies and, and peer authentication, Correct. right? We'll, yeah. show, we'll show those and then we'll, we'll finish up with Spire, and Spire service, Spire agent set up on STO as well and show the, this last portion that I was talking about and see how to, uh, how to install that uh, and how it works. Eight more seconds. One thing I would recommend is if maybe we can just increase the font size. Yes, I'll increase it as soon as I click start here. I think we'll have to, uh, let me see. Let's do that this. should be good, yeah. Should be good, right? Uh, yeah, so if you're gonna go through this on your own time, uh, the first the first module here is just a quick overview and of- And a recap of what we And a recap talking. of certificates and different things that are, uh, a different building blocks, I guess. I'm not going to go through this because there's nothing to demo here per se. Hopefully we don't have to wait another two minutes here. I don't think we will. No, no, no. There you go. There, that was fast. All right. All right. So what's in, what, what is the identity and how can we see this in Istio? So a lot of these things here, I've already, uh, we've already talked through and talked about. So it's Istio uses X509 certificates. These certificates are used by the workloads to prove their identities, identities, right? And then identities can be used to enforce policies using the authorization policy. 
Uh, Marino mentioned Citadel that acts as a certificate authority and actually issues. Uh, and this is the default behavior. Uh, Istio will generate a self-signed root certificate uh, to do that. But then you can also go and switch it out. And then a little bit about Spiffy, which we talked about as well. Uh, and then how, how are these things delivered to uh, the workloads? Istio agent talking to Istio D. Uh, Istio D issuing a signed certificate and then Istio agent streaming the cert and the key to Envoy and Envoy actually using that. Uh, and a great feature of uh, SDS is that you don't have to do any reboots or restarts. So whenever in this scenario, Istio agent will make sure that the certificates are renewed so they never expire. So you can control the uh, uh, the lifetime of the certificate, uh, the expiration time. Uh, but the nice thing about it is that you don't have to restart Envoy Proxy. You don't have to restart your pods, right? So as soon as that gets, uh, 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 the certificate gets refreshed uh, or uh, reissued, it's just going to keep on working together. All right, so the external CA will be using uh, Cert Manager in order to issue the certificates to uh, the workloads. Uh, so let's go and start with that. So I'll be copying commands here. I don't know if I can just make... A play button, I think. You can just hit it and we'll just auto -copy. But I want to copy things. I want to feel like I'm doing something, not just pressing the buttons. <laughs> uh, anyway, yeah, there's a, there's a play button here. If, you're, if you don't want to copy-paste things, just click it there. Uh, uh, so if, I'm assuming everyone used Helm before. Uh, so we're just adding that uh, Helm repo, updating the repo, and then actually installing uh, Cert Manager with that specific version, installing the CREs, creating the namespace, uh, and hopefully it's there. Well, probably not done yet, but I'll press the play button now. Yeah, there you go. So we have, let me go up the screen there. So we have the CA injector, the search manager, and the webhook, all three of them uh, running. So once we have that, what we have to do next is we'll create a um, certificate issuer uh, in the Istio system namespace. And that will be the one. We're going to use the self-signed one here as well, but this will just show you that you could, you could use an actual issuer here. It doesn't have to be a self-signed, right? It's just for the simplicity's sake. And this will be the one, um, this issuer will be the one that will create the Istio's uh, root certificate for the CA. Right? So we have the issuer created in the Istio uh, system namespace. Whoops, I want to do clear here. And then the next thing that I'll do is I'll create the certificate resource. We'll call it Istio CA. That's the hard-coded name that Istio D will be looking for. <laughs> Uh, we're going to specify it and we're going to say that it is a CA, specify the duration, the secret name where the actual certificate is going to be dropped in, uh, and then the key, uh, uh, the algorithm and size, and then the subject that we want to use, and then we're going to reference the self-signed issuer that we uh, created in the previous step. So let me copy this one. There we go. So we created the certificate, and then we can go and check whether the certificate was created. So it's saying that uh, it's ready, and there's a secret. If you look at the secret in the Istio system namespace, we'll have the Istio CA secret uh, that was dropped there by uh, the cert manager. Oh, and this one is showing exactly what I showed already, but describing it. All right, so now uh, what we can do is we'll extract the root CA from that secret file and then create another secret that only creates the root CA, right? Uh, so we'll do that one. So we have the Istio root CA secret created. And we'll create a um, CA issuer. And this issuer is the one that Istio CSR, that's the next component that I'll install, will use to actually issue the certificates to, uh, to the workloads. So this is the CA, right, that we extracted. And now we're ready to deploy the second project called Istio CSR. So this is a Kubernetes controller, works together with the cert manager in order to issue the workloads to, issue the certificates to the workload. So instead of using Istio's control plane, Istio D and the Citadel uh, uh, component in there, 
it will, is going to use Istio CSR to do that, right? And then later in the last uh, lab, we'll show how we can, instead of using Istio CSR, how we can use uh, Spire Agent to do the same. Another Helm install command uh, it just sets the root CA file and then mounts it into, uh, into the container. And if we rerun this, we'll see that we have the STO CSR uh, up and running. And now we're ready to actually go and install, uh, install STO. Note that the change here is that we're going to point to this CS, Istio CSR, and we're basically telling Istio, hey, here's the CA that I want you to use. Uh, we're disabling the built-in CA server functionality and then just mounting the uh, certificate and the key and the root cert inside of uh, uh, Istio Depot, basically telling it to use that. Uh, let's do this one. I ignore this. <laughs> That's good. Okay. It's the same I thing don't. About the version of yeah, yeah, yeah. It's the version of Kubernetes. Uh, have to. 1.30 or 1.23 or something. 2.3. Yeah. 2.3. We, we are non-compliant at the moment. How come you don't have the early release of uh, Ubuntu? What? What is Ubuntu? Oh, I get it. I get it now. That's 1.30, right? Yeah. All right. So we're we're almost there. There you go. So we have Istio installed. Uh, we have Istio D. We have an ingress gateway. We have two ingress gateways, or I think or this is just a little balancer thing. But there's two. Uh, there's ingress and the egress gateway uh, installed as well. So the way that we can actually test that um, Istio D is using Istio CSR to get the workload certificates from there is by installing HTTP bin, or you could have installed any other uh, sample application. So first thing that we're doing, I'm just labeling the default namespace for STO injection, which means anything that gets deployed into that namespace will get a sidecar injected into the workloads or into that deployment. So if we list the deployments, and it's good that I did that, because it's going to take a while, probably. For the query? Uh, no, just uh, pulling down the image. Oh, maybe not that long. Uh, there you go. So notice two out of two already. Uh, that just tells you that there's uh, two containers in that pod. One is the actual application, and the second one is uh, the sidecar proxy, the container called uh, Istio proxy. All right, so let's use proxy config command. And I'll paste it. It's, there's nothing special. It looks a lot of stuff here, but uh, Istio CTL is the Istio CLI. Uh, proxy config is a subcommand that allows you to look at the proxy configuration uh, from the workloads that are running in, uh, in your mesh. And we're saying we are interested in secrets, explicitly in secrets that are uh, next to the proxy that's to in the proxy configuration next to the HTTP bin workload that's running, we're getting the JSON output, uh, and then we're using JQ to parse it and read out the bytes of the certificate chain and then decoding it into the workload cert uh, pen file. It's a very long way of saying, get the certificates <laughs> and get the certificate out. Store it, yeah. yeah. Uh, and then once we have that, once we have the workload cert file, uh, we can then use OpenSSL to uh, uh, look at how this certificate looks like. And we should see, if you look it up here on the issuer, you'll notice that uh, uh, there's the issuer was cert manager, right? And common name was the STO CA, right? Um, and then down here, this is the SAN field, the subject alternative name uh, field in the X509 certificate. That's where that spiffy ID gets encoded uh, uh, in. All right, let me click next. And I think authorization. you're up, right? Yep. To do the, uh, yep, there you go. All right. Uh, maybe I should not mess around with your icons here. Yeah. So we're at this point where Istio and the necessary components like Cert Manager and the Istio CSR have been deployed. So certificates are being issued to workloads. The next step is actually to create this incremental approach to policy where 
we're deciding if we upgrade the connection to TLS, then workloads are allowed to communicate. And then beyond that, authorization to decide who can do what to what services. So once this loads up, we can certainly get to that and we'll be quick. I think we'll be here until maybe 12. We'll be out of here soon, right? Sure. Yes, so we can get lunch 30 early. 30 more minutes. Okay. All right. So we've already talked a little bit about Auth Z and AuthN, so I'm not going to get into too much detail here. But Istio provides a platform to be able to achieve this for you. Um, we're going to go ahead and enable something called MTLS or peer authentication for MTLS. So I already described um, the three types of settings that we can enable in this, this custom resource. We've got the permissive setting, which Basically, MTLS isn't required, but if one service has MTLS enabled and the other service does not, uh, it still will allow the two services to transact and communicate. If we have it set to strict, then both ends of that service need, or both ends of that communication stream require TLS or MTLS enabled. Um, and if it's disabled, then we don't, we don't really care about MTLS at all. So what we're going to do is we're actually going to cr uh, create a namespace called HTTP bin namespace. I'm going to copy all of this, and we're going to label that namespace with the Istio injection uh, label, which means that any new workload that goes into that namespace will automatically have a sidecar injected into it. Uh, we'll create a secondary namespace that actually does not have the Istio injection label, and we'll see that it doesn't get a sidecar. So let's run through that, and let's take a look and see what has been deployed. So by outputting both of these different pods, what we do see is a sleep pod here does have only one container, one out of one, meaning there's no sidecar that exists. The HTTP bin app does have two out of two, meaning the sidecar, the Istio proxy is there, it's present. Um, so what we can do is if we ran a simple curl, which there's a nice little command here for us, the, the request will go through fine and we'll get a response as we expect it to. Um, and we get an accept, we see that things went through fine, um, but we can prevent that altogether. And how we prevent that is this little resource here. Now, this is that custom resource, the peer authentication resource I was talking about, and you can, you can see here, the MTLS mode is set to strict. What's going to happen when MTLS is set to strict? Do you want me to answer? No, 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 no. <laughs> I, I want the audience, I mean, they're paying attention. <laughs> So both ends, yes, both ends require MTLS to be present. Yeah. So uh, actually, to like uh, uh, to be more specific, it's the the uh, presence of a it's the incoming connection has to be mutual TLS. Yes, that's what Strict is saying. Uh, uh, and if it's permissive, it can be either plain text or uh, TLS. Exactly. So, should this request go through now? Absolutely not. We have to give it a few minutes, or not a few minutes, a few seconds for Envoy to actually accept the configuration and then realize that, hey, you know, this other end that we're trying to communicate doesn't have a certificate present. So that's one level, right? Um, now what we can do is we can actually, well, we're going to remove the, the peer authentication policy. But now that we've gotten past um, that whole authentication between services, there's another area I want to talk about, about request authentication. I'm not going to do much here. But I want to talk about the fact that when you have service or when you have end users that are trying to interact with services that exist inside of your mesh, uh, well, you're not going to be, you could use TLS if you wanted to, but the other approach is using a JSON web token to facilitate that, that request authentication. So on the incoming side, we're looking for that jot. And once it's accepted, then we're able to communicate with the, dest the destination service ultimately. Yeah, yeah and I, I think one of the interesting points here is that when you're, the way that I think about peer authentication resource and uh, request authentication, so peer is just for the services. Services are peers, right? And what it does is when assuming, let's assume both ends are doing mutual TLS, right? So with peer authentication, you actually get that spiffy ID information out, and then you can use it later on in the authorization policy. And then with the request authentication, what you can do is you get the information about the uh, JOT token, the claims in that token, and then use that as well later in, in the authorization policy. So think of uh, those two resources. One is for services, services are peers, request authentication is for users. Both of those resources give you 
some values in the JWT, uh, in a JWT uh, uh, the request authentication portion, you get the JWT token and the claims. In the peer authentication, you get the spiffy ID. And then you can use one, both, you can mix and match those in the authorization policies that Marina will show right now. Exactly. So we're going to deploy another sleep pod into the HTTP bin namespace because we want it to also have a sidecar. This is important because if we want to implement an authorization policy, the enforcement point is the sidecar. The other namespace with the service without a sidecar, we don't have enforcement capabilities there because Envoy doesn't exist. So if I actually did a kubectl get pods dash an HTTP bin ns, oops, not bns, ns. Did I miss that? Oh, yeah. HTTP oh, you have in. A... Yeah, I need my B in there. <laughs> there you go. Okay, so now we have that sleep pod that also has two containers of the Istio proxy running. So if we ran a simple curl, this should go through fine. And notice that you know it's, we're making a simple get request. Nothing special here. But what we're going to do is we're actually going to implement a denial authorization policy. It's funny because when you see here, the action says allow. But if you notice, there are no rules to specify the destinations or the actual services or the actual actions themselves automatically implies that this is going to deny all kinds of requests. So let's go ahead and apply that. And then we have to give it a few seconds because Envoy has to process these policies. Because if I attempt it now, the request will go through fine. But if I give it a couple of seconds, now the request should fail. Eventual consistency. Correct. <laughs> I think that's what it's called, right? <laughs> that is exactly it. All right, so we ha we've got the denial policy in place here. And if you think about defense in depth and that whole like buzzword of zero trust, you want to incrementally start allowing services to be able to communicate with each other. One of the things that you would probably want to do is sandbox everything and allow everything to communicate. And then you could start to understand the different traffic flows. Assuming you've got Istio in place already, and then you're using, a, I don't know, some sort of tracing tool or a system that, it, that, that tells you the requests that are going on. Kiali is the one that comes to mind. I don't know if you know of any others that might um, come to your you know, mind. But ultimately, if you have that baseline, now you can start to form your policy posture. So right now, we only have two services, so we can expect to see what they're going to do. Let me clear the screen so I have some more real estate here. And we'll explain what's going on in this policy. So it's the same authorization policy, uh, but what we're doing is we're looking to match on the HTTP bin selector and we're allowing any action that is originating from a service account called sleep. So if I'm sending a request from sleep and I'm going towards a service or a workload that has the label HTTP bin or app equals HTTP bin, then the only method or operations that are allowed or get, and then the only path I can access is the headers path with an asterisk. So there might be like a, an additional, like, I don't know, V2 or something like that. Why this is important is like, as we get more granular here, we can start to determine like how we want to lock this down further. And then we can start to decide to go the opposite way if we want to allow more or be a little bit more permissive with how our services interact with each other. So after applying this policy, I should be able to run a get request without a problem. But if I decide I wanted to run like a delete request, what do you think is going to happen? It should fail, right? I don't think this is a delete request. This is something else. I think it's going to be get, but on a with a path. with a header or something like that. No, it's on a different path. Oh, right, yeah, right. Yeah. Use it. It's going to be an IP. Path. Okay, I can't remember what this lab was about anyway, so it's all good. Um, so, it's not the headers path. Um, if I change this to the headers headers path, it should work. But this is going to be denied. So let's just make that slight modification. What the heck happened here? You'll have to type everything. Yeah, let's try in headers. So that works, right? I mean, it's just a path because it's honoring that one rule here or that one line around paths. What if I did um, a delete? If the thing would move a little faster. What would happen? Yes, access denied. So there you have it. Authentication is the first layer that makes certain of the fact that services can talk to each other and facilitate communication. 
but that doesn't mean that you're allowed to take action yet. Well, you can because there is no policy in place. So that next step is enforcing or putting in an authorization policy, one that is deny all by default, and then other policies that are incrementally allowing services to conduct actions on other services. Now, having said that, we've addressed two of the layers. Let's address the very last layer with Spire and Spiffy. Spire and Spiffy, yeah. yeah so the, oh, it went away that quickly, but the, the principles field that was in the authorization policy resource, that was the actual Spiffy ID, right? That was like, extracted out. That's how I see this in my mind. It's extracted out by the peer authentication policies policy, right? And if we would have user, the request authentication, it would be, I think request authentication field or, or something like that. But we could mix and match those, right? Uh, um, and use both. Like you could theoretically say, well, not only sleep, you can call sleep on, uh, um, you can call HTTP bin from sleep on slash headers using get method. You could combine it and say, well, but only if we have an authenticated user with this specific claim set to that specific value, right? So you can mix and match both. All right, so this is the last portion. And now uh, this will be installing uh, Spire and then see how everything, uh, everything works and comes together. Um, this is all the repeat of, of the slides, more or less, that talks about the Spiffy IDs and then where the Spiffy ID is in uh, 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 NDX 509 certificate that gets, uh, that gets issued to the workloads. It's, it's over here. Um, Spire architecture. This looks like a better diagram than the one that I had in the slides, but it's pretty much the same, uh, same idea here. Uh, the only thing at the bottom there is, um, I think this was added later onto the Spire, the ability to actually templatize the spiffy IDs that you want the Spire agent to issue. However, since we're in SEO, it's going to be constant because it's hard coded. Uh, so it has to be trust domain namespace, namespace name, service account, and then service account name. Uh, that, that's the only difference between the two. Uh, uh, Two diagrams. And let's talk about workload, the node attestation, and uh, uh, workload attestation. So this one has the workload attestation uh, diagram here. Uh, very, very similar as the node attestation. The only difference is that the Spire agent has a set of attesters that knows how to return uh, uh, information or get information from Kubelet, from Docker, from Unix, et cetera. And then it uses those to get back the, to create the selectors that says, oh, we have a pod with this name and there's a process with this ID running inside that pod. And that then gets compared with the registration entries uh, from the Spire server. And if it matches, it's gonna go and uh, issue a workload, uh, workload certificate. So here's, this is the one, this is how these selectors look like. Uh, the entry ID is the registration entry that the server created for this, for a workload with these specific selectors. So you, you see there's a Kubernetes selector, node name, name of the node, uh, name of the namespace, and then the pod UID. So those three uh, selectors uniquely identify a specific pod inside the cluster. And then based on that, a spiffy ID with that Hoot Solo IO namespace uh, service account gets issued. And the parent ID is the actual uh, 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 ID of the workload, uh, of the Spire agent that issued the, uh, issued the spiffy ID for the workload. All right, uh, we've seen this again, just to, to repeat a little bit on the left side is how it works by default when you install Instio without changing anything. Uh, the diagram on the right is what happens when you have Spire, a Spire agent and Spire servers installed. Um, Spire agent actually mounts that uh, socket inside the uh, uh, Istio proxy and then Envoy talks to that instead to get the uh, certificates. And then the last one is the actual important thing, which is the lab itself. 
so what I'll do is I will install um, Spire Quick Start, which is, this is from Istio.io, that, that's a, they have a quick start there. I'm not gonna, oh, we can take a look what's in there. Root data steps, let's see. Data steps, Spiffy Spire, I think it's this one. There we go. Not gonna go through this. There's no, like there's nothing special in here. It's just installation for, uh, for Spire. I think, um, let me see if I can find it. Uh, there's Spire configuration. Maybe I can show that one. There's a lot of CRDs here. Uh, let me see. Yeah, so there's the, the, the part, if you're setting this up for yourself, right? The part that you'll have to pay attention to is the configuration for uh, Spire agents. And then there's also configuration for the Spire server. So this is where you basically specify where the Spire server is. Uh, you specify which attesters to use for the nodes. So we're using the Kubernetes one and we're just saying, hey, it has to be on this cluster with this name. Uh, key manager, this is where the uh, uh, keys are gonna be managed is gonna be in memory here. It could be a SQL backend to do that. And then definition for the workload attester, which we're just saying is Kubernetes and Unix, right? And if I scroll down, I just wanna show the, let's see, I think it's server.conf. Yeah, so there's the configuration for the server. Uh, the important thing here is the trust domain, right? In our case, example.org, it could be your company name.com or whatever it is. You can also specify federation. A couple of weeks back, we did a live stream where we showed how to federate two meshes together uh, using Spire. Um, data store that we're gonna use, uh, the node tester that we're gonna use and what we're allowing. So cluster name, same as in the agent. And then we're saying, well, Spire, Spire agent, uh, namespace and the name of the service account for, whoops, for the Spire agents. Uh, what else? Yeah, I think that's pretty much it here. So let's go and install this. And I know this one will take take a bit. So Spire. Yeah, so we do have three nodes. Uh, <laughs> yeah, there are three nodes. Uh, I think there are three nodes. No, they're not, I'm lying, sorry. It's one node. There's three containers running in this Spire agent. It's gonna come back up, it's crashing, but there we go. Uh, there we go. So we have the Spire server running, we have the Spire agent running as well. Uh, and the next thing that we'll do is we will, oops, um, we will create the cluster spiffy ID resource that specifies, let me do it here. I think there's an apply. There's an apply missing, I think. <laughs> there we go, yeah. Uh, I think it's easier to read here maybe, right? Um, we're just creating a cluster spiffy ID, we call it example, right? And specifying this template that is by the way, hard-coded, this format of the spiffy ID is hard-coded in Istio, trust domain, namespace, and the service account. And we're saying apply the spiffy ID template or issue, issue uh, spiffy IDs using this template to any pods that match this label. So it's kind of additional way of you controlling the, uh, the different templates that you want to assign, uh, the different Spiffy ID templates that you want to issue to uh, specific workloads. So let's do that. I've created that one. So now we can go and install Istio. Um, so let's do that. And I think, well, let me see Istio operator. I just wanna see if there's anything special in, uh, in the operator resource. Yeah, so the, the thing that's special and or different uh, from the typical default installation is we're setting the trust domain to example.org. Uh, this is cluster.local by default. And then we're also modifying the sidecar injector webhook we're creating this template called Spire. And what this one does is this one will mount uh, that socket, that workload socket from the Spire agent into, uh, uh, into the Istio proxy. And then we're doing the same thing for the Istio Ingress gateway. It's just, uh, it has to wait for the Spire to be ready, but anyway, it does the same thing. 
and uh, injects, mounts that uh, socket inside the pot. All right, so we have this installed. Istio is installed. Let's just double check. Istio system. Yep, so we have the ingress gateway, we have STOD. And what we'll do here is, because we already have the ingress gateway, right? The Spire agent should have already issued uh, a workload certificate to the STO ingress gateway. So what these magic commands here are doing, um, getting the ingress pod uh, name, uh, and then actually retrieving the X509 certificate, X509 certificate from the ingress pod. So we're using proxy config secret, same command as before parsing it and then decoding it. It feels like there's something missing there. Yeah, it's decode. Oops. Yeah, you're right, something is. Oh, there it is, that's the one, yeah. So we're saving it into chain.pem file and then we're just using open uh, SSL command to grep for the spiffy ID. And you'll notice, let me see if I, no, I don't grep for this one. Notice that the organization here is Spire. Right, so we know that the Spire is the one that issued this. Well, issuer here, right? Not just the subject. And then down here in subject alternative name, we have that spiffy ID, which is the, ah, oh, I mean, <laughs> sorry. Keeps copying the thing so I can't highlight. Right, there you go. It's example.org namespace is Istio system, service account is Istio Ingress Gateway uh, service account, right? So we already had um, Spire agent issue a, a certificate workload certificate to the ingress gateway. So if you look at the logs from uh, the Spire agent, you'll notice that this is when it actually issued the X509 SWID, and it's saying this was the uh, spiffy ID that was uh, uh, assigned to the workload that was asking for it. And then the next thing that we'll do is we'll deploy a sleep workload and notice here, this is where I'm labeling, adding this label, spiffy spire manage identity. That's the one that we set in the spiffy ID template. And we're also, oops, and I'm also setting the annotation here and saying, hey, in addition to the sidecar template, also use that spire template. And if you remember, the spire template is the one that actually injects or mounts that, uh, um, uh, uh, Unix domain socket inside the STO uh, proxy container. So let's do that. So let's apply it. Oh, this one already had the apply command. So I'll just copy. Yep. Okay. So this one created the sleep deployment. Sleep bot. It's still coming up. There you go. So we have two out of two. Looking at this and what we had in the previous lab and the lab before that, it looks exactly the same, right? There's no, there's no difference. Uh, however, if we um, get the sleep uh, certificate and we actually inspect the certificate, you'll notice that the spiffy ID that was issued was uh, example.org. That's the trust domain there. And then if I remove this here and look at the issuer, you'll see that it was the spiffy that was the issuer here, right? So this, is just, this just shows you how you can uh, say, I don't want to use the built-in thing that Istio has to issue certificates to manage that. I want to use Spire, right? I want to go all the way. I want to manage identity uh, across all of my applications, across like multiple organizations and teams and set up a Spire server or a combination of multiple Spire servers and shows you how you can integrate them with Istio and actually have the workloads uh, uh, issued the certificates based on your um, identity server that you have uh, running somewhere. And I think that was the last lab. Let's see. Yeah, that was the last one. Uh, I don't know if we had, well done. So I'll, I'll keep this up here in case anyone wants to scan it and store the, like, get the, store the link for, for later on. Uh, and go through this, but a lot of, um, not a lot of it, majority of the labs that we went through are not like, they're not custom made, like it's, it's pretty much Istio.io, if you go there, a lot of these things.
things are already there, explained in more details as well, uh, uh, and all the concepts, but uh, yeah. Hope this was useful. Um, any got, questions? Yeah, any questions, of course. It was so good that there's no questions. Ah, uh, no, it's so detailed, so in-depth, yeah. okay. Yeah. Well, thank you everyone for coming to our tutorial. We hope you enjoyed it, and we hope to see you again sometime soon.